What do these paintings have in common? They were each painted with a limited palette of five to eight colors, but the majority were painted with only five colors. I own way more colors than that, but I prefer to work with a limited palette. So in this video, I'll explain my process and reasoning for using a limited palette. We'll make a mixing chart together, and I'll talk about how I use mixing charts to decide what colors I'll use in a limited palette painting. And I'll also reveal my desert island paint choices. So let's get started. First of all, what colors do I own? Let's take a quick little look. I will put a link in the description which lists all of the colors. So if you don't want to pay attention now, that's fine but these are all Windsor & Newton designer's gouache. I just really like the consistency of that brand and it suits my style of working really well. Actually, I need to correct myself. I technically own 18 colors because the two white tubes that I own are not on here because it's white paper and it wouldn't really matter. So <laughs> I have all of these plus titanium white and zinc white. I'll do a quick run through of why I chose these specific colors. Jet black is like the deepest black I could find. It's like staring into a void. It's wonderful. Perylene black or perylene green is technically a black color, but it looks green when you dilute it or add white. It's a very nice shadowy green, so it's great for forests. Prussian blue is a really rich, deep, almost phthalo-like blue. It's super intense, so you only need the tiniest little dot of it in your mixes. Ultramarine is just a great staple color. It mixes really well with a lot of different things and especially nice for skies and water scenes. Primary blue is basically phthalo blue, so it's just a really punchy blue <laughs> and it's really useful for coastal scenes. Windsor green and permanent green middle are just convenience greens, but I honestly barely use them. And when the tubes run out, I'm not going to buy them again, but they're on here because I own them. Cobalt Turquoise Light is one of the most gorgeous turquoise colors. It's perfect for coastal scenes, but I also really like it for skies sometimes because it's a nice warm blue. Quinacridone Magenta is a really amazing mixing color. It's actually really similar to Permanent Alizarin Crimson, which is this color, and I use them kind of interchangeably sometimes. And I really like using quinacridone magenta mixed with a little bit of white for my underpaintings because it just gives like a bright pop of pink under there. Permanent Alizarin Crimson is one of my all-time favorites. Even though it's like a deeper pinkish red, it's my go-to red because it mixes really nice with all my colors. Cadmium Free Red is just the standard cadmium style red. It's very orangey red and I really rarely use it. Burnt Sienna is a really nice color to have on hand for like really earthy scenes or like autumn scenes perhaps. Burnt Umber is another staple. It's really nice for mixing in with my other colors to get like more neutralized or earthy versions of the colors. Yellow Ochre is another one of my favorites and is really nice for mixing neutrals. Cadmium Free Yellow is a kind of orangey yellow. Cadmium Free Lemon Yellow is my favorite yellow because I can make such clean, bright mixes. And even though it's really intense, I can easily neutralize it or make more earthy tones by mixing certain colors together. These are my color mixing charts, and it might look like total chaos at first glance, but let me explain. Okay, now we are nice and organized. <laughs> so what you are seeing here is almost all of my colors. Up here on the top, you can see the pure colors mixed with Prussian blue. So towards the bottom, I start mixing more and more Prussian blue in. And the purpose of this is to show what mixes I will get if I use Prussian blue. And if I'm in a mood for painting something really bright and summery, I can quickly look at this and say, okay, that is definitely brighter than that and that. So this color would be lemon yellow. I will take that. Then I'll come over here and look at my reds and think, okay, maybe the quinacridone magenta, it's a bit more vibrant. I'll go with that one. And then the turquoise light always pops out at me. So, you know, I'd probably grab that one. So it's just a really quick and easy way to see your mixes. And you can do this with all of your colors. So if you pick up permanent alizarin crimson, you can see that I've mixed it with a bunch of my colors to just get quick references for what they might look like. And I find that this is especially helpful when comparing yellows and greens, which let's face it, 
it, that's one of the most important colors for a landscape. It's going to really determine what type of scene you're painting. So let's compare these two, for instance, yellow ochre and cadmium free lemon yellow. Very different yellows. And these are both mixed with the same color, cobalt turquoise light. You can see a drastic difference in the type of green I'm able to mix. So if I'm looking for a more earthy green, something a little more natural or shadowy, I might go with the yellow ochre. If I'm looking for a bright, intense, maybe backlit leaves or something just very spring, I would go for this one. Let's take a look at this one because it's a lot of blues. The more you work within your limited palette and you start doing lots of mixing and exploring, the easier it is to pinpoint exactly what colors were used in a painting or to think of a scene that you want to paint and go, yeah, I need this, this, and this color. And then you can just take it and go. <laughs> so it is a really great skill to have. This was one of my Patreon paint along demos. And if you're interested in that, I could put a link in the description to all my paint alongs. So this scene was painted with five colors, white, lemon yellow, or cadmium free lemon yellow, Prussian blue, burnt sienna, and cobalt turquoise light. These are the mixing cards for those particular colors. So, and this isn't even all the mixes you can get, obviously there's more than this <laughs> that is possible. I don't always use two blues within my limited palette, but in this case, it was actually really helpful because when you're painting ocean scenes, especially the horizon line is typically a cooler, deeper blue. And as you get closer and closer to the shore, the water shifts to a more like turquoise blue because there's more sunlight coming through. So having the turquoise and the yellow mixed into this area made that color really pop out. And then when it came to the rocks, I could just use a combination of the burnt sienna, yellow and Prussian blue to do either the shadows or highlights, whichever direction I was going in. So technically in this case, these were my primaries. The burnt sienna was my red, the lemon yellow was obviously the yellow and the Prussian blue was the blue. So you can see that if you don't use a bright red, you can get these really muted brownish tones and for the highlights of the rock, I just mixed in a bit of yellow or white. For the shadows of the rocks, I just mixed in more of the blue. Okay, let's look at another example. And this time we'll talk about greens because, you know, important for landscapes. <laughs> All of these paintings were made with six colors. That includes white, so we'll put that aside. The perylene black made an appearance for some of the shadowy areas. Prussian blue was my only blue in this case lemon yellow again. And this time I had two versions of red, burnt sienna and permanent alizarin crimson. So let's take a look at the chart for the greens. So in this case, if I mixed my lemon yellow with the Prussian blue, I got these really vibrant, but also deep greens. And then if I mixed my yellow with the perylene black or perylene green, I got more of a muted green, like an olivey green. So when I put that into use, you can see in my shadows, like the trees are casting big shadows down in here. That is when I would use the lemon yellow mixed with the Prussian blue. In the brighter areas, I would mix it more with the perylene green. In this one, I used a lot more of that olivey green. And in this one, I did a very stark contrast. So I had super shadowy trees on the left and the right. And in the center, I did that pop of bright green. And the purple undertone you see in this one, I was able to do by mixing my permanent alizarin crimson with the Prussian blue and a tiny bit of white. So it's very, very diluted. <laughs> if you look down here at this end of the spectrum, you can see these really deep, almost blackish blue tones. That is what I use to do the really, really dark branches in some of these trees. The burnt sienna came into play with some of these brighter highlights on the tree trunks here and here. And it was just a nice, easy way to get that slightly orange, but still earthy color, which of course pops out against all of that green that's going on. <laughs> I want to quickly talk about phthalo blue and green because there's something I notice a lot with gouache users. 
buying pre-mixed greens is really really convenient and you know go for it if that's what you're if that's what you want but there aren't a ton of greens on the market that are more earthy or muted so you end up getting these super vibrant really intense colors and i find that so many gouache users will buy a more phthalo type green and use that as their primary green in their paintings but you get these really really intense green scenes and you find this a lot when people do studies of like the miyazaki movies the ghibli studio so you'll see these like intense pops of green everywhere. So both of these were using my more phthalo blue colors so I could show how much of a difference there is in the results. But if you compare that to scenes without phthalo, you can see how much more natural and um, like earthy or muted you can be with your colors. So maybe you wanna use a bit of phthalo to like bring out a highlight in the water or whatever. But if you leave it completely off your palette, you're gonna find that it's much easier to mix these nice natural tones. I think every color has a place on the palette. It just depends on what look you're going for. So again, I think that's where doing these mixing charts really helps even when you put them side by side you can see the temperature differences like how warm or how cool something is or how much phthalo is in there and how bright and vibrant it is versus more muted I have a link to a video that shows how I made my watercolor charts and it's the same exact process and all I did is just cut them up so that I got these strips because I was able to put them in my bag a little bit easier I find that this is a lot easier to toss into my bag when I go out and paint outside so once you do the chart, just cut it up into strips and there you go. So if I was deserted on an island and I had gouache, which don't ask me why I'm on an island with gouache, but it's the dream, right? And if I could only use five colors for the rest of my life, what would they be? I'm giving myself a break and saying that the tube of white is just a given. Obviously you're gonna need white because you mix that with everything. So we'll put that aside for now. I've pulled out my five tubes of color that I'll be using for the rest of my life on this beautiful deserted island. <laughs> and here is just a quick glimpse at some of the colors I would be able to make. And this just touches the surface of what's possible because each of these is only two colors mixed together. Imagine if you mixed three of the colors together or four or five, all of them together, you could get way more variety than this. So just for fun, we're gonna do a little mixing chart and I'm gonna talk about why these would be my choices and why I think they are perfect for a very limited palette. Virtual Sarah here. Hello. <laughs> okay, so let me explain what's happening. Well, if you've seen any of my other standard square color mixing chart videos, which of course there's a link to in the description, um, you know that what I start with is a diagonal line of the pure color, and then on the top right half of the chart, I mix the colors together, and on the bottom left, I use those same mixes with a bit of white and this will give me a pastel version of those colors. So it's a more useful version of the standard square chart. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the reasons I choose the colors I choose for my limited palettes. For me, the most important aspect is having the most versatile selection of colors possible. So if I'm only allowing five colors in my limited palette, I need to make sure those five colors will give me the most amount of mixes possible. This is why I tend to gravitate more towards vibrant, intense tones, because you can always dull down a vibrant color, but you can never clean up a muddy color. So you might as well start with the most intense versions of your colors possible. At first you might think, oh, that's just gonna lead to really garish paintings, but no, that'll only happen if you don't know how to mix your colors. It's one thing 
going to paint something that looks garish because you don't know how to mix your colors. It's another thing to do it by choice. Knowledge is power. So I highly recommend that you make your color mixing charts and really get to know your limited palette. See what is possible because it's amazing how many colors you can mix with just five tubes of paint. After tons of experimentation, I came to the conclusion that these five colors give me the most amount of versatility. So let me explain a bit about these colors I chose. Why have a tube of black when you can mix black? If I mix permanent alizarin crimson and perylene green and I get the ratio just right, I can create a pure black color. I didn't realize that this was possible until I was doing a lot of color mixing experimentation. And when I discovered this, I was so excited because it meant that I could eliminate the need for having another tube of color in my set. So when it comes to mixing greens, I'm looking for a few things. I need my yellow and my blues to give me a huge variety of greens. And I especially need the option to mix a super, super vibrant, light, like leafy spring green. So as long as I'm able to mix that super bright, almost neon green, I at least have that and I can always mute my greens as needed. After lots of experimenting, I realized that lemon yellow is the ideal yellow on a palette because it's the most intense yellow. You can always muddy it down with various colors, but you can never clean up a dirty yellow. Like in my opinion, a cad yellow, regular cad yellow is kind of dirty. It's a little more orange and it's really hard to create intense, vibrant tones with it. So if I had to choose one yellow, I have to go with the brightest option, which is my lemon yellow. Having a nice bright grass green on the palette is also really helpful. With lemon yellow and Prussian blue, I'm also able to mix a very beautiful grass green. So it's a really good starting place for green. You could always make it more intense or less intense as needed, but it's a nice staple green. And of course we need to talk about blue. I tend to paint a lot of coastal scenes, so I need quite a variety of blues. I need a deep, cool blue as well as some turquoise options, which is why I go with a very deep, intense color like Prussian blue and a cobalt turquoise light. I'm able to mix a huge variety of colors with those. They give me the option to mix a huge variety of very useful colors for my types of scenes. So hopefully by now you can get an idea of how incredibly powerful only five tubes of color are. It's also just a really convenient way of working because if the mood strikes to paint and I'm not 100% sure of what I'm gonna paint, I at least know I just need to grab these tubes and I can start with confidence. Plus, it is incredibly useful to have a very thorough knowledge of your colors, your mixes, when you go outside to paint, because a lot of times you have to paint very quickly, you're outside in the elements, light is changing quickly, it might be about to rain, and you're just getting a loose gesture of the landscape down before the elements chase you away. So getting those color notes really quickly is important, and you can only really do that if you have a pretty good understanding of your colors. Of course, you can have a nice long leisurely painting session outside sometimes and that is like the best day ever, <laughs> but a lot of times I'm forced to paint super quick. You do learn a lot about color mixing when you go out for those quick sessions as well, so it's not like you have to learn everything before you go outside. It's kind of like a back and forth. If you go outside with a limited selection of colors and you aren't super familiar with your mixes, then you'll have maybe a bit more of a frustrating experience, but you will still learn a ton. As I mentioned earlier in the video, I use very limited colors when I sit down to paint a gouache landscape. For me, it's just the easiest way to achieve harmony in my paintings. So instead of having like 20 tubes of color and reaching for every specific color I can think of, I start with a very limited selection and by mixing all of my greens and purples and browns with those limited colors, those limited colors are inherently part of every mix and therefore the whole painting is more harmonized. A 
quick little tip for mixing really dark colors. Sometimes when you paint the color on the mixing chart, it's really hard to tell what color it actually is because it's so, so dark. So what I like to do is get a wet brush and just rub the edge of that color so that I can see the tiniest variation and it just shows me that this is a deep plum color, this is a black color, and this is a dark turquoise color. Okay, so now we have our mixing chart and at first glance you can see that there's a lot of blue and green options for us. But this is only with mixing two colors together. So I'm gonna grab my sketchbook and we're gonna mix like three or four colors together and see all the variation we can get. The goal of this exercise will be to make some browns and grays and just more neutral tones. I'm not gonna do too much more. You guys get the idea, right? <laughs> so once you settle on a few colors, like three to five colors, do a mixing chart like this, and then just take another page and do a neutral mix and just see all the variation you can get. And then remember when it comes to painting landscapes, so much of it isn't just about individual color, it's about color relationships. So how the colors look next to each other and how we perceive them together. So that's a whole other topic for another day. <laughs> um, but I hope this was helpful. And if you have any questions at all, please ask away in the comments and I'll do my best to answer. And don't forget to subscribe before you go because in the coming months I will show you how I use this limited palette to paint all sorts of different gouache landscapes. Okay my friends, stay inspired and I will see you again soon. Take care.